you so much. I'm always afraid people are not going to show up at these things. Uh, Chancellor Gee, Mrs. Gee, thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor to be invited to deliver, to be part of such a prestigious lecture program. And um, I'm very thankful. The, um, I'm also thankful to be in this Nashville weather been down in the single digits. Somebody asked me if I came down on JetBlue. <laughs> American Airlines, baby. <laughs> um, the subject of my talk this evening is indifference. <clears throat> it's about how we are quick to express apparent concern about the various terrible things we see or hear about on the news, but in reality we're often indifferent to them. They may seem regrettable or even horrible to us, but not to the point where we're willing to take any affirmative steps to counteract what we don't like, what we see and think ought to be changed. Somebody said to me, if your topic is about how, how most people are apathetic and indifferent, doesn't that mean by definition that the audience is not going to be much interested in your little speech, <laughs> Bob? <laughs> So that filled me with a kind of panic. And then I s replied after giving that some thought, well, the people who turn out here to listen to this by definition are not indifferent, so any of the nasty things that I say to tonight obviously do not apply to anyone <laughs> who is in this room. Anyway, here goes. Uh, sometimes in my line of work, you can feel that you're wading through a kind of hell. Some of us in the news business see way too much of the worst aspects of life. Not too long ago, I was in New Orleans in one of the ruined neighborhoods, and there was a middle-aged man standing in a yard in front of his house, what was left of his house, actually, which had been wrecked in the flood that followed Hurricane Katrina, and he was just standing there weeping, crying. Um, a year after the storm, he was still lost in his emotions and couldn't believe the devastation that had occurred on his prop property and most likely to his family. So I approached him, ready to ask a couple of questions, which is the sort of obnoxious thing that reporters do. But this time, the man just looked at me and just waved me away. I mean, he just indicated with the gesture of his hand that you know, he did not want to be approached, and so I walked away. But I did mention that in the column, and it, it, it affected me. This man was lost in his grief, and it was one of the saddest things I've ever seen, actually. So bad things are our stock in trade when you're in the news business. I remember as a young reporter approaching the city editor of the New York Daily News to pitch a story, and I thought I had all the angles covered, human interest, this and that, but before I'd had a chance to say anything, the editor looked up in apparent annoyance, and he did not have the time for the details of my story. All he wanted was the answer to a simple question, and he asked it in a voice with a Brooklyn accent that was raw with the cynicism that can come from hearing too many blood-soaked narratives. Like, he was like a, the Daily News was like this. This guy was like a character from a 1950s detective novel. When I went to the Daily News, I don't need to tell you how long ago that was, but when I went to the Daily News, the, the guys still wore hats in the newsroom, and everybody smoked, and it was the din of the typewriters around 4 o'clock as deadline approached, and they had a little jug in the, in the drawer, and if you went down one floor to the sixth floor, you could place your bets, because not only were the printers there, the bookies were there as well. <laughs> so that's what the Daily News was like, and that's what this guy was like. They had, a, they had a city editor at the Daily News named Dick Blood. Can you believe that? <laughs> True. But anyway, like a character from a 1950s detective novel, he looked up at me and he said, how many dead? That's all he wanted to know. And he was serious, and that was the measure of the importance of the story, the totality of the carnage. And that's what a lot of reporters deal in every day, as you know, wars, plane crashes, terror bombings, crime, 
That's our stock and trade. Having said this, I also feel that most Americans, living in the greatest comfort zone our species has ever enjoyed, know too little about that part of life. Even sanitized dispatches out of Baghdad or stories about torture and rendition have a tough time competing for the public's attention with the antics of Paris Hilton and Britney Spears or the latest humiliation of a guest on American Idol. I mean, um, can you believe, what's, what's the woman's name who just died? Nicole, <laughs> right, can you believe the coverage that, she's, that, that that story is getting? I mean, it just, it'll come on with Iraq for like a minute and a half and then on to the real story. So tonight I'll take a look at how those of us privileged to live in that magnificent comfort zone that I mentioned often, not always, but far too often, exhibit what I see as a regrettable indifference to the tremendous hardship, suffering, and death that is taking place all around us. And I'll start with an experience that frightened me more than anything else in my entire life. Back in the late 1980s, I got caught in a massacre in Haiti. <coughs> Excuse me. I was with a group of reporters and photographers who converged on a polling station in Port-au-Prince to cover what was supposed to be the first election after the ouster of the dictator Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier. The polling station was at an open-air school, which consisted of two buildings on either side of a huge courtyard. As we walked into the courtyard that beautiful Sunday morning, we saw several dead bodies strewn about. Reporters who stepped into the building to the left and to the right of the courtyard found more bodies. These were people who had just been killed, about 17 or 18 in all. And they were just ordinary men and women, most of them poor and illiterate, but, be but dressed in their starch Sunday best, who had been shot to death as they showed up to vote. Most likely they were killed just moments before we arrived. Two or three actually died right in front of us. Suddenly, the gunmen, dressed in what looked like police uniforms, returned to the entrance of the courtyard. I can still see it, like down there. And they opened fire on us. To escape, we had to run to the rear of the yard and clamber over an eight-foot wall with bullets whizzing all around us. Two or three more people were killed, including a driver for ABC News. I wrote a first-person account for the Daily News, and the paper played it up big as only a tabloid can. And when I returned to New York, I was welcomed with tremendous warmth and affection by friends, families, family members, and co-workers who had been incredibly worried about my safety. There was no real reason in that case for them to have given much thought to the people who had been killed in the massacre, and they didn't. Their thoughts were with me. But I remained disturbed for the longest time by the enormity of the tragedy that I had seen, the faces of those ordinary men and women frozen in horror at the instant of their deaths. Having thought that I was surely about to die when the gunmen opened fire on us, I had a sense of what they had experienced in their last moments of consciousness, and it filled me with a level of pity and sadness that felt like a kind of nausea. Now fast forward to the present day. That massacre in Haiti in November 1987 was small potatoes compared to the carnage that is occurring day after day in Iraq. This time, however, the carnage was unleashed, sparked by our government. In other words, in our name. So you might think that this would heighten our concern for the victims of this war, our soldiers who are dying or suffering grievous wounds and the scores of thousands of Iraqis who have endured horrors that are all but unimaginable to us. What is happening in Iraq is a tragedy of mammoth proportions. But despite the widespread news coverage and the incessant television analyses, the general public has been largely indifferent to the boundless suffering and tremendous loss of life there. I noticed in talking about this with friends and colleagues that it tended to make some people uncomfortable. I was cautioned against making sweeping value judgments from a holier-than-thou perch about something that they felt might or might not be true. So I went back and gave the matter more thought. 
Obviously, there are an awful lot of people who are concerned about the important issues of the day. All I have to do is look at the tremendous amount of mail and email that I get from readers in response to the various stories that I cover. In just last month, something like a quarter of a million people turned out in Washington for an anti-war protest at the Capitol. It's only fair to acknowledge that there are enormous numbers of serious people who are concerned about, and in many cases working very hard, on the difficult issues we face. And there are people in government and in our great universities, as here, for example, at Vanderbilt, and at foundations and NGOs, and in our religious communities, who are doing their best. But the evidence seems to show that, in general, for reasons that I will try to lay out, the wider public is becoming increasingly indifferent to some of our most important problems. And this is happening at a time when these problems are growing increasingly complex, not to mention more dangerous, and thus more difficult to solve. It's not just the war and terrorism. Think global warming or the long-term economic prospects for the American family in the age of globalization. Think about the fact that New Orleans, a great American cultural center, was all but washed away and nobody knows how to put it back together. These are problems that demand not just our talent and our energy, but also a sense of urgency. This is not a time to have our collective heads in the sand. Am I saying that most Americans are indifferent to these matters? Yes, I'm afraid so. And here's an example. This is from a story that ran on the front page of the New York Times on February 4th, just a little over two weeks ago. It's about a powerful tragedy, but I'm sure hardly anyone remembers it. This is a quote. A mammoth truck bomb obliterated a popular central Baghdad market on Saturday, ripping through scores of shops and flattening apartment buildings, killing at least 130 people and wounding more than 300 in the worst of a series of horrific attacks against Shiites in recent weeks. The attack was the work of a suicide bomber who detonated about one ton of explosives in the bustling Sadria market, a largely Shiite enclave, at 5 p.m. as shoppers finished buying food for dinner and men sipped coffee at cafes nearby. The bomber struck close to the middle of the narrow market, killing everyone nearby and dozens more in collapsed apartment buildings and coffee houses that line the market. That's the end of the quote. Many of those who were killed in that terrible tragedy were women and children. Some were infants. Some of the victims were blown to pieces. Their blood, bones, bits of flesh blasted in all directions, eradicating any possibility that they might somehow achieve a modicum of dignity in their death. Stories like this, which should hit us like a blow in the solar plexus because of the tremendous human suffering that they depict, have become, at best, white noise, the constant, low-level rumbling of a distant war. For most people, it's nothing really to do with them, nothing to get personally concerned about. The stories get tuned out. When my assistant went out a few months ago to interview college students about the war, she came back with comments that were pretty revealing. A 19-year-old sophomore at the University of New Hampshire told her, none of my friends even really care about what's going on in Iraq. I'd say we're indifferent. We just don't spend a lot of time thinking about Iraq. A history major at Wesleyan told her, I get the feeling that most people at school don't even think about the war. They don't think about how this will influence their lives and the world they live in. They're more concerned with what grade they got on yesterday's test. This callous disregard for one of the great tragedies of our era is hardly limited to a handful of college students. It's widespread. The people in my own circle of friends do not seem particularly upset about this war. They tend to be hostile to the Bush administration and opposed to the war. They didn't ever think the war made sense, but they don't exhibit any strong visceral reaction to the endless tales of horror. I have friends, and you probably do too, who will erupt with a much greater sense of outrage at a bad call in a football game or a public display of boorish behavior by a celebrity than to a report that another hundred Iraqis or another dozen GIs have been killed. 
One of my friends is a young professor at USC. The war doesn't affect most Americans, she told me. It just doesn't. I'm a diligent newspaper reader, but I'll be the first to admit that I just scanned the articles on Iraq. My colleagues don't talk about the war, she said. They're into their research and their next publication. When it comes to Iraq, their attitude seems to be, well, yeah, people are dying today like they were yesterday and the day before that and the year before that. I know it sounds terrible, she went on, but you know, most of us do not have people going to war in our families. There are no shortages of goods or rationing like there was in World War II. Most of us have good jobs. The quality of our lives is fantastic. It just doesn't impact our lives. When I hear people talk like that, maybe especially when I hear good friends of mine talk like that, I think of the comments that some of the great people of the past half century have made about the phenomenon of indifference. Elie Wiesel, recalling his time in a concentration camp during World War II, said in a speech in 1999, of course, indifference can be tempting. More than that, seductive. It is so much easier to look away from victims. It is so much easier to avoid such rude interruptions to our work, our dreams, our hopes. It is, after all, awkward, troublesome to be involved in another person's pain and despair. Yet, for the person who is indifferent, his or her neighbor are of no consequence, and therefore, their lives are meaningless. Their hidden or even visible anguish is of no interest. Indifference reduces the other to an abstraction. Wiesel's comments reminded me of the people I saw whose lives had ended that Sunday morning in Haiti. When I think of people like that in relation to us, those of us who are lucky enough to live as privileged Americans, I think of them almost as shadow people people who live and often suffer and die in the shadows, outside the busy glare of our self-absorbed consciousness. They are people whom many of us assume have nothing to do with us, the people in Darfur, those suffering in Iraq, the New Orleans residents who may never be able to return home. They are shadow people, not fully human. They are indeed abstractions to us. Two comments from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. address the idea that whatever we may think, we are not really separate and apart from those people because we are linked, whether we realize it or not, by our common humanity. We are tied together, Dr. King said, in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. Whatever affects one affects all indirectly. The other thing he said was, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Why are so many of us so indifferent? Well, Elie Wiesel was certainly on to something when he spoke about our attitude toward the other. Think, for example, of the contradiction in our own revolutionary period, when a nation conceived with the highest ideals of liberty and the rights of man prospered at one and the same time from the bloody atrocity of slavery. Most of the time from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War, this nation was governed by presidents who owned slaves. As far as the white population of that time was concerned, those black slaves were certainly the other, not fully human. Many Americans today look at Muslims as the other, which helps explain why the loss of 3,000 lives in the U.S. on September 11th was a staggering emotional blow. But the slaughter of scores of thousands of innocent Iraqis in a war that we launched does not cause much of an emotional ripple. There are, of course, other more prevalent reasons for remaining indifferent, and most of them are pretty easy to understand. I'm grateful to Dr. Carl Marcy, a psychiatrist and director of social neuroscience at Massachusetts General Hospital, who was kind enough to walk me through some of the technical aspects of this. We sort of know instinctively that human responses to stimuli fall into three general categories. In the first instance, there is the possibility that someone might respond to the source of the stimulus by engaging it, approaching it, as something that is interesting or relevant. Those individuals are the opposite of indifferent. 
The second possibility is to deliberately avoid the matter as something potentially harmful, dangerous, or distasteful. Our protective mechanisms kick in. We might in some cases, as I did in Haiti, actually run away. The third and most common response is to simply ignore most things as irrelevant. There's an entire universe of activity humming all around us all the time, and most of the time, at least on a conscious level, our response is indifference. Iraq and Iran fought a hideous war for eight years that generated more than a million casualties. Most of us hardly noticed. So what determines whether we as individuals actually become involved in some of the more or less significant issues that are always out there? Start with self-interest. If your kids are in the local public school system, you're more likely to become involved in school issues. It becomes relevant and interesting to you. Back in the 60s, it was a heck of a lot easier to get a gigantic anti-war protest going because there was a little thing called a draft that was sweeping up a lot of us baby boomers. We'll also become engaged if we see that there are rewards to be reaped. Politicians are an obvious example here. Power, fame, and lots of money can be had for those who are skilled at the very public game of politics. And then there are the media. A columnist like myself is rewarded with a nice living and a fair amount of positive recognition for writing pieces about people in trouble and other issues of the day. <clears throat> I'm paid to make value judgments, a fact that pretty much undermines any pretensions to sainthood. Finally, there are the ordinary people who are outraged by the suffering and injustices they see and are interested in the important issues facing their society including long-term issues like the physical and economic health of future generations, global warming, nuclear deterrence, and the like. I think they become involved because they recognize the importance of these issues to themselves and to their children and grandchildren. They know they will be better off living in a cleaner, healthier, safer, and more economically secure environment. So why don't more people see this and act upon it? And that brings us to the second category. <clears throat> An awful lot of people are afraid to engage. Someone may feel overwhelmed by the images of starvation and killing in Darfur, or the destruction wrought by a suicide bomber in Baghdad or Israel. They may feel helpless in the face of such enormous tragedy and wonder why it makes sense, what good it could possibly do to continue watching or thinking about such horrors. It's emotionally overwhelming for some people. They may feel that they already have plenty to deal with in their own lives, jobs, family, perhaps an illness or disability or poverty or whatever. I can't tell you how many people tell me that they never read a newspaper because it depresses them. So that's the second category. <clears throat> the biggest category of all is the third one, the group that Dr. Marcy has referred to as the ignore population. And this is where you will find the people with the highly developed, out of sight, out of mind mentality when it comes to problems that are not directly their own. This is the crowd that is way more interested in celebrity gossip, whether Britney Spears is drinking too much and taking care of her baby too little, than the fact that parts of New Orleans still like, look like Berlin after the war, or that the war in Iraq will ultimately cost us $2 trillion or more, or that 200,000 people have been killed in Darfur, and another two and a half million have been driven from their homes. The latest cell phone gadgetry might get their attention, but they would not be interested in any significant way, for example, in the chilling but little known fact that a woman in our society is raped or otherwise sexually assaulted every two and a half minutes, or that homicide is the second leading cause of death for girls 15 to 18, or that 78% of those girls are killed by an acquaintance or an intimate partner. Nobody much cares about those facts. We don't talk about them. Most people have no desire to even think about them. We are, for the most part, indifferent to them. <clears throat> now, some of the people in this so-called ignore population are what I call hardcore ignore. They are like the people in the early years of our country who were unmoved by the horrors of slavery and those later who were blind to the suffering of blacks under Jim Crow. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. These are the folks who never give a second thought to the hardship that the war in Iraq has imposed on so many of our own American soldiers and their families. I have spoken to people in this category, and their response to the plight of the troops is essentially, well, they volunteered. One of the reasons I'm so convinced that the majority of the population is basically indifferent is because we've let our own wounded troops fall into the category of the shadow people, as anonymous to most of us as the victims I described in the massacre in Haiti. To allow that to happen to young men and women who have answered our call to lay their lives on the line in defense of the country is unforgivable. Unforgivable. We owe them, and we are reneging on that debt when we ignore them. Consider this case, a 27-year-old Army sergeant named Eugene Simpson, Jr., who told me what had happened to him in Iraq. A roadside bomb exploded with tremendous force next to Sergeant Simpson's Humvee in Tikrit, the hometown of Saddam Hussein. When I saw the explosion go off, he said, I tried to jump back into the center of the Humvee for more protection. Everything went in slow motion for about 15 seconds. I saw scrap metal and dust and everything flying by me, and I felt it hitting me all in my legs and my back. It felt like hot metal burning my skin everywhere. It hurt so bad, he said, I couldn't cry. Sergeant Simpson's spinal cord was severed in the explosion. He's paralyzed from the waist down. He talked to me about being airlifted from Baghdad to Germany and hearing the moans and the cries and the weeping of the many other wounded soldiers on the plane with him. He remembered the terrible grief of the soldiers in the military hospital in Landstuhl, where most of the evacuees from Iraq are taken. He saw amputees and soldiers who were paralyzed or suffered brain damage or other crippling injuries. The last time I saw Sergeant Simpson, he was sitting in a wheelchair watching a flat screen television in the basement of his parents' home in Dale City, Virginia. He seemed to me to be almost literally in the shadows, a young man in a wheelchair sitting alone in a basement. My point is that all of us need to be more aware of what's really going on in this war, however we feel about it politically. It concerns our fellow citizens and millions of others in the most profound ways. It's an awful thing to remain indifferent to it. A doctor named Jean Bowles spent two years as the chief of neurosurgery at the medical center in Landstuhl. During a widely disseminated interview, Dr. Bowles was asked if the badly wounded men and women that he was treating were mostly kids. Well, I can call them that, he said, since I'm 62 years old. They were 18, 19, maybe 21. They all seemed young, certainly younger than my children. As a neurosurgeon, I mostly dealt with injuries to the brain, the spinal cord, or the spine itself. The injuries were all fairly horrific, anywhere from the loss of extremities, multiple extremities, to severe burns. It just goes on and on, he said. As a doctor myself who has seen trauma throughout his career, I've never seen it to this degree. The numbers, the degree of injuries, it really kind of caught me off guard. One of the things I noticed while I was researching this talk was that while I was convinced that most people were indifferent to most of the bad things going on around them, very few people seemed to be indifferent to the plight of strangers caught up in emergencies, which seemed odd to me. There's all kinds of scholarly information available about the various forms of neural activity that underlie the kind of behavior I'm talking about. I'm obviously not qualified to go very deeply into that. But it does seem pretty obvious that in most cases, we don't actually like to see people in trouble or suffering. And this is why the worst images of the war are not televised. <clears throat> I've often had the radical notion that we should flood the TV with gruesome war images. If people saw what was really going on, they would try to put a stop to it. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. There was a tremendous outcry, as we all know, when the federal government was so slow to respond to the victims of Hurricane Katrina. Americans could actually see the men, women, and children in tremendous distress, and they didn't like it. There have been many cases of strangers who came upon traffic accidents and tried at great risk to themselves to save the occupants of burning vehicles. 
An extreme example of this kind of behavior occurred in New York. You've probably heard about this. A man had a seizure and tumbled off a subway platform. Another man waiting on the platform with his two daughters unhesitatingly jumped onto the tracks to save the stricken man. There happened to be a train coming into the station and there was not enough time for the Good Samaritan to haul the stricken man back onto the platform. So he pushed the stranger flat on the ground between the rails and then pressed himself on top of him. The train passed over the two men, both of whom survived. I hate when stories like that happen when I'm preparing a paper on indifference. <laughs> this stuff is complicated. We're not indifferent if something horrible is taking place in front of us. But it seems that as soon as some distance is established between us and the individuals or the population in distress, indifference kicks in. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the reasons the so-called ignore population is growing is not primarily that hardcore ignorers are becoming more numerous. It seems to be, ironically, because all of us are being bombarded with too much information. People who used to be interested as a matter of course in what was going on in the world are now being inundated with information, so much information that it becomes impossible at times to differentiate between what is relevant and what is not. <clears throat> Tremendous amounts of data come pouring unbidden into your computer, as you know. Information, most of it useless and much of it annoying, comes at you in the form of junk mail, television commercials, and even news programs, which may have a dozen boxes on the screen at one time, giving you bits and pieces of information on a dozen different stories. So many boxes, they tend to cover up the primary interest primary image on the screen. You'd be looking at Wolf Blitzer and the box here, boxing Wolf is eventually blotted out. This is not the information superhighway. This is an information nightmare. So it's completely understandable that in this kind of environment, millions of thoughtful, rational people would just tune out. There's too much data to even begin to process, much less respond to. I think of this as indifference in the service of psychic self-preservation. So where does that leave us? It leaves me hoping that I've made the case that there is widespread indifference to extremely important matters in our society and that there are myriad reasons for that indifference, but that was not the primary purpose of my talk. What I'd really like to get across is why we should not allow ourselves to be indifferent to some of these very important matters. And the primary reason, of course, is that the longer we remain indifferent, the longer it will be before we begin to address these issues, alleviate some of the suffering, save some of the lives, and begin to create a better environment for ourselves, our loved ones, and our neighbors around this planet. So how do you fight indifference? People in the comfort zone that I talked about are not going to turn off their TVs en masse and suddenly run outside with visions of remaking the world, no matter how much I might like that to happen. Something is needed to overcome their indifference, to coax them or provoke them into a willingness to get involved. And the first thing that occurred to me was the crucial role that leadership plays in counteracting indifference. As we've seen, one of the major reasons why people turn away from the biggest problems confronting us is that they feel helpless in the face of them. They don't feel they can do anything about them, anything that would be meaningful, in other words, really effective. What can the average American do about Darfur? What about New Orleans? What can the average American do about the war in Iraq? The Democrats won a big election last November and they can't do anything about it. What could we do about it? But let someone of a certain stature step forward, offer people a plausible way of doing something constructive about a difficult situation, and attitudes tend to change. <clears throat> people begin to pay attention. And many of those who were previously indifferent begin to think, you know what, this might be worth taking a crack at. I think there's been a dreadful lack of effective leadership in the U.S. for the past several years. I think this has been the case on almost all fronts, and I think that this has contributed a great deal to the level of indifference that I'm talking about. I think... <clears throat> I 
I think the national leadership has gotten this country into a deeper and deeper, deeper fix, so bollocked up it's difficult at the moment to see a plausible way out. I think the black leadership in this country has been remarkably ineffective for the longest time, and the result of that has been an array of problems that most of us know about and that few of us think will be solved in the near future. I think there's been a failure of leadership, or more accurately, an absence of leadership, on women's issues for a long time, and that has contributed to a national sense of indifference to a range of problems, domestic violence, the pornography industry, sex trafficking, that are having a harmful effect on millions of women and girls in America and many millions more worldwide. So if we need leadership, where is that leadership to come from? And that brings me to what I see as the most hopeful feature of this subject that I've been wrestling with. <clears throat> Every leader does not have to be a Martin Luther King. It's wonderful when they emerge upon the scene, a Lincoln, an FDR, a George Marshall who gave us the Marshall Plan in the aftermath of World War II. But history tells us that these are rare occurrences. What's important to realize is that leadership can get itself going in a small way at first, like a burst of blossoms in an obscure corner of the forest. Leadership can most certainly begin with ordinary people, people who somehow resist becoming completely absorbed in their own daily lives or absorbed vicariously in the lives of the rich and famous, people willing to take even a small step toward engaging those matters that affect not just themselves and their families, but their neighbors, their fellow citizens, and even perhaps those many fragile and vulnerable people who are our fellow tenants in this troubled abode called planet Earth. The key is to understand in our hearts that we as individuals have the capacity to act, that we are capable of taking the initiative, of working with others in however modest a fashion to help mold the forces that affect our lives and that may affect the lives of our children and grandchildren. We are not helpless, and we have an obligation to avoid succumbing to feelings of helplessness. This country, this nation of free people, is our collective responsibility. When we look for leadership, the appropriate first place to look is in a mirror. To those who say that's not reasonable, the problems are too complex, too daunting, I respond by asking, are they as daunting as the problems of slavery that confronted the early abolitionists? How about the abject state of black Americans in the days of Jim Crow, which is the situation that faced the brave and no doubt lonely men and women in the vanguard of the civil rights movement? In fact, when you think about it, the biggest, most far-reaching societal changes of the past half century, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, were not primarily the result of elective politics, but rather the hard work of committed citizen activists fed up with the status quo. I want to get across the idea that ordinary people really can make a difference that those aren't just empty words drawn from a civics textbook. It's reality. But indifference, whether it's the result of a sense of helplessness in the face of what looks like overwhelming problems, or a sense of apathy born of cynicism, or a feeling that these issues don't really relate to one's own personal life, or a habitual tendency to believe that these matters are somebody else's responsibility, whatever the reasons for it, Indifference fights the reality that the efforts of ordinary people really do matter. If it were true that ordinary people are incapable of making a real difference, then the United States of America loses its essential meaning. It's no longer a compassionate, welcoming, representative democracy committed to the very highest ideals. It's simply a place where the hapless masses watch television passively waiting for that ominous moment when the events unfolding elsewhere finally reach our doorsteps. That's no way to live. I believe that we can still exert control over the events in the world. I believe that our very passivity affects the events in the world for the worst. If ordinary Americans had risen up, for, ex for example, against the war in Iraq, a terrible tragedy would have been averted. 
Life is not a movie, and we should not allow ourselves to be reduced to a nation of spectators. If you think it's time for the war in Iraq to come to an end, or if you think changes need to be made in the way that health care is administered in this country, or if you feel our elected officials have not paid enough attention to the expressed will of the people, or if you feel that men and women who have worked for years and followed the rules and kept their noses clean are not getting a fair shake economically, if you think that these or any other issues are compelling and deserve your attention, turn off the television. Roll up your sleeves and do what you can. Talk to your neighbors. Call or write your elected officials. Volunteer to help in political campaigns. Circulate petitions. Attend meetings. Protest. Run for office yourself. Support good candidates who are running for office. Register people to vote. Reach out for young people. Speak out. Encourage others to walk away from the empty embrace of apathy. Stay informed and vote every chance you get. Those are some practical, practical considerations, and my bet is you'd be shocked at what people committed to an important task can accomplish. And you might be shocked, too, at the feelings of delight that can accompany each forward step you might take on a matter that is important to you. I have seen in my work and in my readings of history the miracles that can be wrought by ordinary people. But you can't fashion a miracle sitting in front of the television set watching American Idol. You have to take some form of assertive action. There are other considerations besides the practical for overcoming indifference. These matters can be looked at from a moral perspective. And for that, I go back to Elie Wiesel. He spoke about the feelings of abandonment that, on top of all the other horrors, afflicted the prisoners in the concentration camps. Our only miserable consolation, he said, was that we believed that Auschwitz and Treblinka were closely guarded secrets, that the leaders of the free world did not know what was going on behind those black gates and barbed wires, that they had no knowledge of the war against the Jews that Hitler's armies and their accomplices waged as part of the war against the Allies. If they knew, we thought, surely those leaders would have spoken out with great outrage and conviction. Well, of course, people knew. There were those who knew, but they remained indifferent. And Elie Wiesel tells us, to remain indifferent to that suffering is what makes the human being inhuman. He goes on, <clears throat> indifference elicits no response. Indifference is not a response. Indifference is not a beginning, it is an end. And therefore, indifference is always the friend of the enemy, for it benefits the aggressor, never the victim, whose pain is magnified when he or she feels forgotten. The political prisoner in his cell, the hungry children, the homeless refugees, not to respond to their plight, not to relieve their solitude by offering them a spark of hope, is to exile them from human memory. And in denying their humanity, we betray our own. So I'll close tonight by saying that my great fear right now is that with the technological miracles that have become a staple of our age, we now have the equipment, the wherewithal, to bury ourselves deeper and deeper in our comfort zones, which is, which is a way of distancing ourselves farther and farther from the very human concerns of others. No good can come of that. Thank you very much.
since it's not an encore. <laughs> we are going to take questions for a little bit, and um, uh, I'll answer questions on any subject you want, actually. If it has to do with the talk, fine. If it's something else, that's fine, too. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> That's what my editors always said to me. Who's dead? Uh, if something, I, I, I don't know if something terrible happened. I hope not. Maybe it was a false alarm. But if I had been out there, I would have been running up with my press card. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. So I'm sorry I can't tell you. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I also hope I'm not in Nashville missing a big story. <laughs> a little embarrassing. Somebody had their hand up over here? Yes, sir. I know a little about it. Uh, Paul Krugman has really been the, the guy on the op-ed page who's been focusing on health care. Um, the Massachusetts thing has gotten um, an awful lot of applause, and uh, especially a lot of applause uh, from a lot of my liberal friends. Um, there is something about it that just makes me uncomfortable. And, um, you know, before I speak definitively about it, I need to learn a little bit more about it. But People like to say it's like auto insurance. You know, if you have a car, you're required by law to have, um, to have insurance. But that only applies if you have a car. If you don't have a car, you don't have to buy auto insurance. And I'm um, a little concerned about the precedent of obliging people to purchase something just based on the fact that you exist, that the law says you must do this. So um, that makes me uncomfortable. But obviously we need to do something about um, the health care system. Uh, it may be that this turns out to be a fantastic program and that my concern here is, you know, it doesn't amount to much. What do they say in Casablanca? It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. So they say that a lot about a lot of the columns. So. Yes, sir, in the back. He's got a, he's got a microphone. Does it work? It works. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned a lot of folks with a lot of problems. You did not mention the plight of the Palestinians. Would you address that, please? Um, the, the, one of the reasons I haven't talked much about the uh, situation uh, with the Palestinians is I haven't, I haven't covered it. I, I, I try to um, stick with the stuff that I have uh, a, a certain depth of knowledge about. I mean, obviously, I'm a newspaper reader. I think that... Um, the Palestinians are in a very tough situation, but I think that the whole Mideast situation is a tough situation. So if we're, I don't want to make a comparison about the plight of the Palestinians or the plight of the Israelis who have to put up with suicide bombings and that sort of thing. What I would say about that problem is that I think it's exacerbated by the fact that our own administration has not addressed the Middle East problem in the way that it should have, in the way that other administrations have spent a great deal of time and energy doing. And if, if, if the United States re-engages that situation, then I think that we can bring the level of tragedy down somewhat. Are you marginally indifferent then? Pardon? I say, are you marginally indifferent? Am I marginally indifferent? I, I'm not indifferent at all. I just don't feel... Um, that I have, since I haven't covered the issue, I don't think that I am in a position to speak confidently about specifics as far as that's concerned. I mean, I've spent my time, you know, looking at Iraq and terror. I have spent much less time um, looking at the situation with the Palestinians. So I just feel a little uncomfortable speaking 
um, definitively about it. I am not at all indifferent about that situation. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm actually going to um, give a keynote address that the um, Legal Defense Fund is having a seminar on criminal justice up in New York. I think it's on March 2nd. I have to give another speech. I can't believe, I can't believe it. Um, I think that um, I think people do not understand what a mess the criminal justice system is in this country. And I am um, so not pro-crime. I remember David Dinkins is a good good friend of mine now. <laughs> When he was um, mayor, uh, he happened to be mayor at a time when crime was all but out of control um, in New York. And I remember going to the uh, interviewing his police commissioner, Lee Brown, and Lee Brown said he didn't have enough police officers to get the job done, which is extraordinary for a police commissioner to say that on the record. And I went back and wrote a story about it. Daily News, of course, makes it the lead story, a big page one tabloid headline and stuff like that. And essentially it said, um, the mayor has to do something about this problem. He's not giving the police commissioner the resources to fight it and that sort of thing. And eventually that was part of um, sort of a push that got a lot more police officers hired. The irony is that by the time these police officers got hired, trained, and up and running, Dinkins was out and Rudy Giuliani was in. So he had this big new, <laughs> he had this larger police force to fight crime. But I, I say that just to say that I am hardly pro-crime. Um, I, I, I see the victims of crime frequently, and the stories are horrible. But the flip side of that is that there are an awful lot of people in prison serving tremendously long sentences who are innocent, who did not commit the crimes um, that they were convicted of. Uh, there is an awful lot of chicanery that goes on with prosecutors and other people in the criminal justice system. And I think that that, too, is, the, I mean, I'm talking about on a, on a big scale, on a vast scale. I mean, I'm not going to go into Tulia, but some of the people here know about some columns that I wrote about a town in Tulia, Texas. So this is an issue that needs to be addressed, and it's not being addressed now. But I think like so many other issues, that's just one of many issues, myriad issues, that are being overshadowed by the war in Iraq, and we're never going to get to address any of these issues in a serious way until our engagement in that war is ended. Yes, sir. It, what is your opinion on the role of churches in America with regard to Iraq? It seems to me like they're absolutely failed. Uh, there are no profits. Well, um, on this one, I'm just going to go back to... Um, to my talk um, about the level of indifference, I think that if um, I think that if some of the people in the various congregations, the various churches, or the the synagogues, or if if they spoke up and they said to their religious leaders, "We are really upset about what is going on. We think that some kind of uh, action needs to be taken." We want you to speak out more. I think that the religious leaders would respond uh, to that, but that, that is not happening. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm a little stunned that despite the polls, which show overwhelming opposition, at least at this point, to what's going on in Iraq, there's not a real outcry. And because there's not that real outcry, that's why the president is able to get away with <laughs> getting a, having an election, which was a mandate to get us out of Iraq, his response to that is to send more troops in. Way in the back. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Hearing somebody talk about indifference to a room full of people, and I, I mean, I, I take your point that you're probably preaching to the choir because not everybody here is indifferent, but I also think it is you talked a little bit about pragmatic examples. I'm wondering if you could uh, speak in terms of your own individual leadership outside of your capacity as a columnist. Has there been anything that you have seen in just your ordinary everyday life, not in Haiti, not in Iraq, where you've looked at something and said, yes, I can make an incremental impact, and this is something that I can do to overcome a personal level of indif indifference and, and make a difference in your own life? 
Um, yes, and I'm uncomfortable talking about it. Um, one, I don't like to toot my own horn, and two, um, I feel uncomfortable being active in any kind of political or civic way while being an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. So I'm going to have to punt on that question. I'm really, it's a really good question, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to answer it. Uh, they want you to um, sort of not look like there might be any kind of advantage or, or, or some outside factor that you're pushing or whatever. We're not even supposed to, we're not even allowed to endorse candidates in the, in the column. I'll give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. My wife is the head of the Posse Foundation, which is a wonderful uh, college scholarship foundation. There are Posse students here on the campus of Vanderbilt. That's how I met her, covering that story. And I did, um, did a column on Posse, then I did a follow-up column on Posse, and then we started going out and then no more columns on Posse, even though I think this is such a great, it's, it's lucky she's been getting you know, attention elsewhere. So I just try and keep it separate. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. All the men are asking questions. Some of us uh, remember Vietnam. And Vietnam was supposedly the first uh, war that was brought into our living rooms. And one of the things that made us wake up to what was happening in Vietnam. Uh, back then, we had three or four channels at the most, and now we have 70 or 80. And supposedly, at least possibly, the, the exposure to the Iraq War would be so much greater, but the reaction seems to be less. Do you know why? Um, I'm not sure I know why, but I have a couple of guesses. One, um, the, the, the wars now, the, the, there was a change of policy in the administration. So in Vietnam, the reporters would go out into the field, and they could pretty much go wherever they wanted to. And there was some fantastic war reporting coming out of uh, Vietnam, which brought the real story to readers and viewers that was different from the official account that we were getting from the Johnson administration. Uh, it is now since, I guess, the first Gulf War, reporters, they, the, the administration tries almost to force reporters to be embedded uh, with uh, military units, uh, which gives you a skewed view to start with. But that's been compounded by the fact that the, the war in Iraq is just so dangerous and no one knows who really the, the enemy is at any given time that you almost need to stay pretty close to the American forces. And so you don't really get out there to get the complete story. But I still think that they're doing, a lot of reporters are doing a great job out of Iraq. But you get these, people get most of their information from television. And you get these ritual reports from Iraq, wherever it is, on nightly news or CNN or whatever, and then it's boom, now it's on to Anna Nicole Smith. And Anna Nicole Smith is a story that gets the really intensive coverage. Imagine, maybe if you had that kind of coverage on Iraq, maybe it would turn the viewers off and they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't watch. But imagine if you had that kind of coverage coming out of, um, coming out of Iraq. I mean, I just think that if people knew more about how hideous this war really is, then I think that they would be more up in arms. And I'll give you one quick example. <clears throat> I've done a lot of columns on uh, wounded American soldiers. It's, it's really, it, it's so upsetting to, to spend time with them. There was one fellow that I talked to, and um, he was suffering from uh, uh, some, some emotional problems. And at the end of the interview, and he had been, I was interviewing about three soldiers that day, and at the end of the interview, I could tell that he was troubled about something. He's really young. I think he was 20 years old. Sweet kid from Ohio. And I could tell he was really troubled about something. So I went back to him. I had my tape recorder on. And I said, you know, was there something more that you wanted to say? And he said, yeah. He said that he was upset about something. So I said, you know, you know what is it? Tell me about it. And he said, he started off by saying that he had always been very religious, that he had been very religious growing up, that he had... Um, um, that he had spent a lot of time in church and Sunday school and studying the Bible. And then when he went overseas, he didn't really have a problem with the war and fighting the enemy. And he had been, in a, he had been wounded a couple of times, one in a terrible encounter where he had to kill some insurgents. So he started talking about that, and that's what he was upset about, the fact that he had killed somebody. 
So I said, do you remember how many people that you killed? And he said, he said yes, three. He said, at least three, yeah, at least three. And I said, and what is it that bothers you about that? So he said, it didn't bother me that I had to fight or that I had to shoot or that I had to kill. I understood that that was my duty. But I am afraid that when I finally die, that this will prevent me from being allowed into heaven. And so he has to walk around with this idea that even though he did his duty and he feels that he was right to do his duty, that he'll be denied eternal salvation because of doing his duty. I think people need to understand that this is the way some people are affected. I think there ought to be television cameras all the time down at Walter Reed Army Hospital where if you walk around, if you're lucky enough to get in, um, they didn't want to let me in. I got in because the, the, the mother of a wounded soldier brought me in as her guest. If you walk around the grounds, there are lovely grounds inside, you know, the manicured lawns and sort of curving sidewalks. But as you're walking around, the people that you see on the sidewalks are somebody coming down with one arm and one leg or somebody in a wheelchair with no legs or someone who's clearly paralyzed or someone with just one limb left or someone who is blind who's being led along the grounds. I mean, this is the, you're just surrounded by that. People need to know that. Americans need to see that. That's sort of one of the points that I think that when people really have a grasp of what a serious situation is, that nine times out of ten, they'll make the correct political decision about what we need to do going forward. But I think when people don't really know what's going on, and then they're spun by the various politicians on the left and the right and in between, then it's, they either make uh, incorrect decisions or they just throw up their arms and say, you know what, I'm out of here. Anna Nicole, what channel are you on? Thank you very, very much.